You're eating up all my time, and most of you know I need a lot of time, okay? Thank you for that. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, and thank you all. You are, uh, you're amazing. You're just a wonderful group of people, and, and these, how many love the House of Prayer Nights? Isn't this just special? <laughs> Obviously, you're here. <laughs> thank you. God, God bless you. Anybody else want to attack the stage? Okay, thank you. I didn't even see her come up on me. Lord help us. Security, let's be vigilant here tonight, okay? But uh, we're, we're in, we've started a brand new series, and last week, Pastor Todd was amazing, as he always is, by kicking us off uh, with our series, Salt and Light, and we've kind of used the phrase that Jesus talked to in, in, in uh, Matthew chapter 5, where he was doing his Sermon on the Mount. And uh, he, he said that you, he was telling the disciples and everyone that was following him, you are the salt of the earth. And then he goes on a little bit later and he says, you are the light of the world. He called them salt and light, all of his followers. And so we're looking at this phrase and seeing how that translates into 21st century America. What does it look like for you and me to be salt and light in a world that needs it so desperately, but really, to be honest, they don't want really either one of those things? Well, I believe the answer for us to become salt and light to our world is found in Galatians chapter 5. So they kind of join together. Over in Galatians chapter 5, it talks about what is called the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. And, and those characteristics, the, the fruit, that are born of the Spirit in our lives and are shining out through our lives. And when they do, they affect everything and everyone around us. When the fruit of the Spirit is showing out of a believer's life, these nine fruit of the Spirit... What happens is they're counterculture. They go against what everybody sees and what everybody thinks. In fact, the way that we actually become salt and light to our generation is by allowing those fruit to dominate our lives and our inner world. See, in, in other words, the fruit of the Spirit, when they become visible in us, then we are seasoning our culture. We are revealing Jesus to a dark and chaotic world. That's what happens. So that's what we're talking about. The fruit of the Spirit. Now, here it is in Galatians chapter 5. What are these fruit? Well, let's look at them. But when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, last week, we talked about seasoning our lives with love. And this week, oh, and, that, and that, we, that is like the most important one of all of these, love. Everything's born out of love. But I believe the second most important is peace. That's just me. So I want to deal with peace here tonight. And peace is so important, isn't it? In the world we live in, peace is something that everyone desperately wants, whether we know it or not. You know, if I were to ask you, when I say peace, what is it that you think of? What do you, what do you think of? I get a whole lot of answers. In fact, I asked a few people this week. People define peace many different ways. Some say peace is vague, you know, and, and they don't know whether they, they possess peace or not, whether they have it. Some say it's confusing. Some say it's big. Some say, you know, peace seems so global. You know, it's global. And that was interesting. That, that really is a bit confusing to me. I understand the confusion because I've seen these people that have that bumper sticker. These are the global ones that say visualize world peace. Have you ever seen that? That's right. Yeah. And that really confuses me. I really don't understand what all of that means. I don't know how that clicks, you know, because anytime I get close to a guy that has that bumper sticker on his car, what's he do? You know, he usually turns around, gets mad, flips me off, does that type of thing. You know, and I'm just sitting there following as I'm trying to visualize this. He needs to probably visualize bigger bumper stickers. I don't know if he doesn't want me to get near him. But, but, but we, we may not, in a group this size, we may not come up with a common definition. But, but, but here's what I do know. You want it. You want peace. Even if you can't define it, you want it. I know you want it. And the world wants it. I mean, let's face it, we want it physically, don't we? 
I mean, we we, we want to feel at peace physically in our lives. That's why so many people are medicating themselves. You know, we are considered the Prozac, Xanax nation. I want to feel at peace with my body. We want peace relationally. Right? All of our, our, our significant relationships, we want them harmonious, you know? And if there's tension between us in our relationships, what, what happens? You know, it, 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 it makes me feel uneasy and awkward. I got to have peace in my life with other people. We want peace for our future, don't we? And isn't that really, I mean, we've got this big election coming up. Isn't that what politics really is all about? Planning for a peaceful future? That's what it is. And some of you, you're working so hard for your retirement, you know, and and, and you want peace. You want to retire in peace because once you retire, let's face it, there's no more worries in life, are there? That's it. No more worries. You're on your own. There's no more problems anymore. You just sit back in your recliner and drink your prune juice, you know, and you become a burden for your children, you know, that type of stuff. It's awesome. That's retirement. But let's see if we can clean this whole thing up about peace and and really come to a picture of what God's peace looks like. So what we're going to do with peace tonight is I want to take a look, first of all, at the picture of peace, and then I want to look at the problem that we have attaining or getting or holding on to peace, and then we're going to talk about God's plan for peace that will cause people outside of these walls to see something different within us. And that they would say, you know what, that's what I want. That guy is salt. That guy is light. How many are with me? Okay, are you still with me? All right, here we go. First, we're going right into the picture of God's peace. I'm going to do an outline tonight. Take notes. Take pictures, okay? I want you to take this with you. This stuff is too important just to leave right here. All right, the picture of God's peace is what we're looking at. Now, the biblical word for peace, let me give a biblical definition for peace. It's the absence of war. The absence of war. That's what peace is. And and, and here it is. When the Bible talks of peace, it's talking about having an absence of war with God, having an absence of war with others, and having an absence of war in my own inner world, in myself, okay? Okay. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. Here's what it says. By him, talking about Jesus, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of his blood on the cross. Okay? Because of what Jesus did on the cross, I do not have to have war with God. Jesus took care of that. We don't have to have war with God if we just accept him. I can have peace with God if I accept what Jesus did for me on the cross, right? And I can have peace with others. And and this really, having peace with others is a little bit more of a difficult challenge. Maybe you've heard of Charlie Chaplin, the the famous uh, silent movie star back in the 1920s. He He had a famous quote, and here's what it was. He said, oh, I have peace with God all right. It's just that I don't have peace with man. And we can understand that, can't we? A lot of people are going, you know, me and God, we're close, man, but I just don't get along with people. Other people, we just don't get along. But the scriptures challenge us to live at peace with one another. Look what it says in Romans 12, 18. Do your part to live in peace with everyone. 2 Corinthians 13, live in harmony and peace. Then the God of love and peace will be with you. So let's get the picture here, okay? God wants us to have peace with him. God wants, and we're challenged now to have peace with others because because of what God has done for us. And because of what God has done for us, we can also be at peace with ourselves as well. Jesus said in John 14, I'm leaving you with a gift. It's a gift. Peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give isn't like, and you can circle that, isn't like. It isn't like the peace the world gives. He says, so don't be troubled or afraid. Now, the the, the peace that the world gives, what is the peace the world gives that Jesus is talking about? Well, we understand the peace the world gives is full of empty promises, isn't it? All you got to do is turn on the television. And you look at the commercials that are on TV. What do those commercials do? They make all these hefty promises. The world promises. And you know what they do? They overmarket and they under deliver. It's snake oil sales. That's all it is. 
That's why in the scriptures, it's just the opposite. The scriptures make the promise in Romans 8. If the Holy Spirit controls your mind, there is life and peace. That's what God gives. That's not a TV commercial. That's the real deal that you can take to the bank. See, now, now, as we get this picture of peace, I want to be very clear. We're talking about, remember, absence of war with God, absence of war with men, and absence of war with ourselves. It's very different than the world. And in fact, it's very different than the way the world sees peace. Sometimes they see it as relaxation. It's not relaxation. That's not what peace is, right? It, it, this peace that God's talking about does not mean that there's no longer going to be difficulties in our lives. There's no longer going to be hardships. Actually, it's just the opposite. In fact, what the Bible talks about, and anytime you see it, peace is this sense of contentment and confidence in the midst of our difficulties, right? It's the concept of Jesus in the bottom of the boat while the disciples are on the Sea of Galilee and a big storm shows up and everybody, these, kids, these disciples are screaming like schoolgirls and what does Jesus do the whole time? He's sleeping in the bottom of the boat. They think they're going to die. That's how bad the storm is. Jesus is, that's peace. When storms all around my outer world are attacking me, my inner world can be at peace. Does that make sense? That's the only way that we can have godly peace. That's the only way that godly peace is different than the world's peace. Well, there's other ways too. But it is so important to understand that God's peace doesn't take away the difficulty. He just says, man, I'm going to be with you through it all. That's God's peace. And that's what I want. That's what you want. But, 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 with, but, but hear this. With everything that we want so badly, let's face it, it's not easy to own, right? Which moves us into the second thing I want to talk about. And that is, we got to look at the problem in getting peace and hanging on to this peace. See, the problem is I have, well, I have a little list of enemies to peace in my life. Now, I have my little list. I'll share it in a moment. But what about you? You have a little list as well. And, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's a list of enemies of peace. Think about it. Let me hear what your list is. Throw a couple out at me. Come on. What is it? Technology. That's a biggie. What else? What's your enemy to peace? What? Distraction. What else? People. What is that? Somebody yelled out. I thought I heard somebody say kids. Kids. Yeah, kids, that's right there, baby. And that's almost violent right there when you yell that out. I saw that. That's the way it works. We've got all of What else? Give me another one. Mother-in-law. Mother that's not working right. This thing's going downhill fast. I mean, you guys are all yelling so much. Listen, it, 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 this, is, this is the Wednesday crowd. This is our demographic here, you know. Just yelling, I got problems, buddy. Let me tell you what they are. If this were Sunday morning, the people wouldn't even be getting past the introduction right now. I'd have to be throwing things to wake them up. So it, you, this Wednesday crowd is awesome. But we all, those, those come to us fast. I've got my little list. And I've got a big list. Let me give you my little list, okay? Here it is. My list of enemies to peace. Traffic. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Bills. Long lines. Yeah. Hostile people. Yeah. Don't look around. Don't look around, okay? <laughs> Cell phones ringing in church or the movie theater, right? Any amount of time spent at Chuck E. Cheese. That's an enemy to peace. S spam calls, right? Email, forwarded email, email stories that I have to pass on to everyone I know or else my children are going to die in a fire. Do they still do those right now? Now that's my little list, right? But my big list is a little more universal. But my big list is something that's easy to spot because it's something on the surface. It's, it's surface in all of us, okay? But every one of us kind of deal with it. And they get, they, they get to us. One of them is stress. This is on my big list. How many feel stressed during a week? Yeah, a bunch of us. Another one to write down is noise. Noise is an enemy of peace. 
I mean, we love noise. As a matter of fact, when we're silent, we get bothered, right? When it's silent. We wake up to noise. We've got these big alarms, you know, that go off. And then we wake up. We go in. We turn on the TV or the radio. We're doing breakfast. And then we jump into the car. We turn on talk radio. We hear Joe Biden's speech for 15 times and every gaffe that he made and every commentary they got to talk about. So we go through that. And then we get out. And, and then and then we, we pull out our phone and, and we... We listen to our, our uh, put on our headphones and we listen to those playlists that we built about 15 years ago when our kids stole about 500 songs off of a Russian website, you know, and uh, we got all these great illegal, you know, but we've still got them. FBI's after me. I know how it works. And we listen to all of that. And then we go into work and man, it's just noise. And then we get done with work. We go home. We're eating dinner. We turn on our DVR. We turn on uh, uh, the thing on the TV, we watch what we're watching, everything that we've downloaded, and then after we've eaten, we've got a full night, and then when we go to bed, we turn on late night TV, and we have some late night host that tells us all the different reasons why we live in a noisy world, why we can't rest in our lives and don't have silence. We go all day long with noise, and noise is an enemy of peace. Another one to write down. Information overload. That's an enemy of peace. We're surrounded by information. Pastor Todd, last week, he said he grew up in Canada. They had two television stations, right? Okay, that's why that country is going nowhere. Okay, so here it is. Listen. Now, I grew up, we had three television stations, okay? We had one on them, okay? And, uh, you know, but, but now we have like 900 stations, you know, a hundred of them are news, you know, and a and hundred are sports. You know, you got all these news stations. I can find out if Tucker Carlson got a haircut before he ever comes on the TV because they're talking about it on every station before I ever get there. It's information, information. It's always coming at us, and it's an enemy of peace. Here's another one to write down. Relational conflict. That's an enemy to peace. It's a big enemy. You know, if we could just get rid of people, you know, life would be so much more, you know, what's disturbing right now? Many of you are wondering how you can do that. I'm telling you, we have help for you. So make sure you don't leave without that. Here's the last one to write down. I am an enemy of peace. I'm an enemy of peace. Not me, Brad Baker. You can put your name in there, okay? You are an enemy of peace. Many of you are going, yeah, you are. My wife is going, yeah, I get that one. <clears throat> You're an enemy of peace. We are. It's not just other people around us that create confusion in our life. It's me. I'm unsettled. I'm unsettled about my past, my present, my future. And, the, and what happens to us when these enemies of peace come into our life? They put us in this constant reactive state. And when the enemies of peace come, we want to react to them. And the way that we react to these enemies is we cope with them. We just cope with, we learn how to cope with them. And we've learned these coping strategies ever since we were little kids, right? Now we've grown up to be big kids and we're still coping. We've just gotten a whole lot better at it. You might recognize some of these coping strategies. We worry. That's how we deal with the enemies of peace. We worry. It's a coping strategy. How many of you say, I have a master's degree in worry? Yeah, I'm with you. I can worry about anything. Just give me a topic. I can worry about it. Throw a topic out. Yeah, well, I'll throw one for you, the Cardinals, okay? We need to worry about the Cardinals. We need to worry about the Cardinals. You know, but it's like on Sunday, you know? I, I can come to church on Sunday and, and I could be, this is the this is Cardinal. it doesn't even matter. It's, just, it's a game. And I'm sitting here and I can think about this. Are, are they gonna, you know, uh, uh, is, is anybody gonna show up to church today? Because the Cardinals are playing, you know? I've got my DVR going. Am I gonna be able to get it on the DVR? I, did, I, did I put enough time on there for it to record? You know, is somebody gonna tell me the score of the game before I go home, you know? That type thing, you know? Uh, who's gonna do all of this? You know, it, 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 what's, and I'm, worrying about something that is worthless because we know they're going to lose. See, we, we can immediately move into all these different worries no matter what the subject. 
And those of us who worry, we had those signs. We had those signs, remember, from churches. The church wants to help if we worry. Remember that. It says, remember that sign from a church that said, don't let worries kill you, let the church help? The church wants to help us with our worry. We worry to help cope with the enemies of peace. Here's another thing that we do. And I hate to tell you this one because this is one of mine. We control. Say, say for example, an enemy of peace comes in. Let's just say it's stress, okay? We try to control things that we actually don't, that, that, we, that we, have, we think we have control over, right? We try to control people. We try to control our environment or our schedule. Because if I control something, then my life feels a little bit more in control. It's the curse of a pastor, it is. It's the curse of a pastor feeling weak in control. That's one way I cope with the enemy of peace. And look, some of you, yeah, listen, he's clapping. Some of you look a little smug on me right now. You're going, Brad, you're a little off. You're a little messed up. You're a little insane. I get that. But understand, I haven't gotten to your issue yet, okay? And I'm going to get there before it's over. And if you're looking a little cocky, I'll jump to pride right away and you're in trouble, okay? Here we go. Let me give you another one of these. Let me give you another one of coping with enemies. We consume. You know, if you've got the financial resources, you consume. You know, you want to buy. You want to buy peace in your life. I see people do this all the time. That car, that bigger house, all these things. Whatever it is, that's going to make me relax. That, that'll bring me peace. You know, I have my eyes on that new little iPhone, iPhone, you know, 35 or whatever it is now. You know, it can take pictures of, of a hair on a frog's back. You know, all of that, I've got to have that. That'll help me. That's what i got to have. And we try to consume because we want to buy peace. Not only for ourselves, listen to this. Sometimes we consume to buy peace for other people. See, if I can help you, maybe that will bring peace in my life. This is especially true if we have kids. Right? I, 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 you know, uh, if, if I give this to you, you'll finally leave me alone. Right? That's the way we do. You know, we have that kid, you know, as a boy. You got a 12-year-old boy, you know, and he wants to play an instrument. And, and you're going, what instrument are you going? I want to play drums. Every 12-year-old boy wants to be a drummer because it's so cool. Dad, you said you would help me. You would support me in all that I do. Come on, Dad. Come on, Dad. I need a drum set, drum set, drum set, drum set, drum set, right? And so think of how stupid this is for a second. In order to buy peace, you go out and buy your kid a drum set, right? Now, that is not smart. Let me just give you a word of advice here, parents. Instead of buying drums for your kid, go out and buy him some gloves and some face paint and convince him that the coolest thing in the world is to become a mime. That's it. That's awesome. That would be great. But we consume to cope with the enemies of peace. Now, let me just get the rest of you here that I haven't gotten yet, okay? Another thing we do to cope is we procrastinate. We say, you know, I don't worry. I don't try to control things. I don't consume. I just don't do anything. You know, I just let it all go. I just, I just pretend it's all going to go away. So what these are, these things I'm talking about, worry, control, consuming, procrastinating, they're just coping strategies that we have to deal with the enemies of peace in our life. They put me back in this reactive state so that when the enemies of peace start coming in around me, I can react, then I cope, and then I go back and I react, and then I cope again, and I do it again and again and again. It reminds me here, I got this ping pong table, right? Right here, you got a ping pong table, and you got this, you got these ping pong balls. And the way this works is, is, I just wanted this so you could kind of visualize it. These balls represent these enemies of peace that come into our life, right? And they come in like a flood, like this. And then you've got this, you've got these paddles that are all of these things, the way you deal with it, the procrastination, the worry, all those different things. And you sit here, and when the balls come at you, you, you got to smack them, you know? And then they come back at you, and you react, and you cope, and you hit them again with your coping strategy right here. And then they come back at you, the ping pong ball, and you hit it again. It's like the worries and the issues or the, the enemies of peace come at you, and we use all of those things that we combat it with, those coping strategies, to fire it back. But it doesn't get rid of it. It it keeps coming back to us. It keeps coming back to us. You see how this works. It's a great visual because this is how so many of us live our lives. The problem is there's nothing peaceful about a ping pong game. 
Something, somebody has to lose. And instead of recognizing how silly we look when we're doing that, going back and forth, instead of recognizing this is coping strategies that we're doing, we're just getting better at it and better at it. And we say, bring it on. I can do this. I can do it. And we never, ever get to the root of the reason why we don't have peace. We're on the surface and we're dealing with the surface. We're just playing games. See, and it's not that difficult for me to look at somebody and look at their life and see if they, they have peace or not. And then to look at somebody's life and see if they're playing games and they don't have peace. And that's the picture of what, the picture of what God wants to do in our lives. Is he wants to invade us, believers. He wants to come in and give us a peace, the gift of peace that will blow us away. The peace that our minds can't fully even understand. But in order to get this, because we can't bring peace to others if we don't have it ourselves. We got to stop playing ping pong. We got to stop playing the games and we got to dig deeper. What's the root of all of this? Why don't I have peace the way I should? The way the Bible says I should. We got a chair. Here it is. We got a chair right here. And I got this to communicate a more reflective place in your life, where you're sitting, and you're, maybe you're having your quiet time, but where you think and where you move, you, you can see it's worn out. This is the time you spent so much time there thinking and musing. If I could take you out tonight after service, and is our custom, go to In-N-Out Burger and sit down with you across from the table, and we would talk about peace in your life, or the lack of peace in your life, if I was to challenge you in that moment to remove the mask... Peel back that layer in your heart and go after why you really don't have peace in your life, okay? If we were to do that, just sitting face to face, do you know what we would find if we just dig it out and get to the root? Deep inside, we'd find for many of us, the deeper issues is we have fear in our lives. We have fear. For some of you, you got fear. And oftentimes, fear is about your future, the things that are ahead of you. And then others of us, we might have anger in our lives. If we peel it all back, doesn't mean that you're a raging lunatic. No, you just have anger in your life. You're not dealing with things well. You never deal with it well. And you can't have peace when you're filled with anger and it's easily triggered. And anger is a present emotion. See, and I can't have peace if I have anger. And all the other surface Issues that are enemies to peace are born out of these two and another one. Guilt, and that's a biggie. We might find that you have guilt in there. If we peel everything back, maybe from something you've done in the past, fear of the future, you know, f fear of the future, anger that's happening in your present world, and guilt from the past. As we look deeper and peel it all back, we find that many of us are living with fear, with anger, and with guilt from the past. Some of us just visit those areas, but many of us have built condominiums and we live in those areas. We're riddled with it, see? And all of those things can interrelate with one another, you know? I mean, I can get angry about something, then all of a sudden I feel guilty that I got so angry and then I'm fearful that I'm never going to change and it's going to keep happening over and over. See how that works? They work into each other. And then chaos comes where there needs to be peace got a mirror here, and it goes along with the chair, just for a second. If you're one of those people that you say, I need peace desperately in my life, maybe when you dig a little deeper and you look in this mirror and you look inside, maybe you see, I've got fear, I see where it's at, I've got anger, I've got guilt, and you're not addressing any of it. You're not dealing with any of it. You're over here on the ping pong table playing games with it, coping with it, passing it along, and you just keep wondering, why am I still a mess? Why is this happening? I'm losing the war with peace. Maybe you need to grasp tonight what I like to call some cowboy theology. Cowboy theology, it goes like this. If the horse is dead, get off. It's like my favorite country song. It's been lonesome in the saddle since my horse died. See, it ain't moving. 
It's not working. You're losing. So you can, you can either keep playing games and avoid peace, or you can pursue God's plan and find peace. That's what it's about. And I spent a lot of time on the problem because I want us to see where we're at and all of us that have our need. Because the plan, it will stick and it will get strong if we realize that that's me. I need it. I need a plan for my life to live in peace. So let's look at God's plan for peace as I close here tonight. I'm calling this the spiritual fix. This should be easy for us all to remember. The spiritual fix. And fix is an acronym, okay? It's going to be an acronym so you can remember this. And what I'd like you to do this week, I'm going to read this passage. I want you to think about this passage. I want you to, to muse over this passage. It's in Philippians chapter 4. I want this just to kind of get in. You don't have to memorize it. But just look this over this week. I think it's going to be something valuable as it relates to uh, 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 possessing and living in peace in our lives. Here it is, Philippians 4. It's on the screen. Do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for what he has done. If you do this, you will experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, let me say one more thing as I close this letter. Fix, there it is, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right. Think about the things that are pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you have learned of me and heard from me and saw me doing. And the God of peace will be with you. Such a powerful scripture. So what is this fix we're talking about? You want to take some steps toward peace in your life? Here they are. Fix the F stands for filter the noise. It's possible. It's something I can do, filtering the noise. Notice I didn't say delete the noise, because you can't. We live in a city. You'd have to move into a cave or a monastery somewhere to delete noise. You can't do that, okay? But the reality is uh, uh, we can do our job in filtering out the noise. Now, what is noise? The noise I'm talking about is the sound in busyness. It's the sound and the busyness of our lives. Why do we need to filter the noise? We filter the noise so we can focus our attention on God. Noise is the key distractor that keeps us away from what God wants to speak into our lives. I can't focus on God when I'm surrounded by noise, when I'm on the run. Look at verse 8. Fix your thoughts on what is true. I can't do that when I'm busy. I can't do that when I'm surrounded by noise. What is true, what is honorable, right. Think about things that are pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. You filter so you can focus. And the more time you spend with God and you allow God and his truth to flush through your system and your life and be part of your life, guess what happens? The more peace that you're going to have in your life. Let me give you some coaching on this. If you want to filter, unplug. Learn how to unplug. That's a, man, we just don't do that enough. That's a big part of it. Unplug some of the noise, you know? You've, seen, you've heard about must-see TV. No such thing. We need to be must-be people. What does the psalm say? Be still and know that I am God. We need time where we unplug. We talk about fasting, fasting food, fasting these things. Listen, learn how to do a media fast. Just turn off the TV. I'm not talking about for a year. I'm not talking about a week or a month. I'm talking about just turn it off for a day. Start somewhere where you turn off the noise. See, in my life, everything that is plugged in is the opposite of pure, lovely, honorable, and true. I need to unplug. Let me tell you another thing about filter. Here's a way you can do it. Lighten up. And I'm not talking about your personality. I'm talking about lighten up your schedule. Right? Some of you college students are taking too many units. You need to lighten up. You know, some of us, you know, our schedules are out of control. We need to lighten up our schedule. You work in the marketplace and you're working to make money so that you can buy peace and you're not going to get there. You're just playing games. You got to learn to lighten up. You can't focus on God when you're surrounded by noise and busyness. Makes me think of a question. Are you afraid to be quiet? See, Good. does silence bring you fear because you've got to face what's going on in your life? 
Huh? If it does, then you probably need more quiet time. Reflecting before God. Set that time every morning where God can just bring his peace into your life and you connect with him. So that's F, filter the noise. Number two, F-I. I is investigate for truth. Paul in his letter to the Philippians says, continue to investigate God's ways. Look at verse 9. It says, keep putting into practice what you learned, what you heard, and what you saw. And what's the result? And the God of peace will be with you. The challenge here to investigate for truth is that if Jesus is the Prince of Peace, don't you think that's worthy of investigation? If Jesus said, I'm going to leave you my peace, my peace I'm going to give to you, don't you think that's worthy of investigation? If the fruit of the Spirit says, when the Holy Spirit controls your life, you're going to produce peace, don't you think that's worthy of some investigation? See, to seek after that, when we talk about seekers, a lot of times we talk about people that are trying to come to the Christian faith and checking it out. But there are those of us who have known the Lord for years. We need to be seekers as well. Seekers of investigating the truth. We might be different. God, make us different. Let me be salt. Let me be light. I want to be different. I want to investigate your ways. I want to know more about you because the more I know about you and your truth, the more your truth changes my life. Oh, that's good. You may not like, that is good. Brad, you're awesome. That was great. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Filter out the noise. Investigate the truth. Now, I've got to close. The X in fix. X out the enemies of peace. Your fear, your anger, your guilt. X out those enemies of peace. Let me just say something about this. The X is kind of cool. You know, and not only does it just fit this acronym, but... X, if you, if you realize it, it's the Greek letter for, for Christ. For, it's the chi, and it is the first letter, letter of Christ in the Greek alphabet. So when they spoke of the Christ, the letter chi, the X, was the way that they spoke of him. Understand this. This is cool about this whole deal. The X is a symbol that Jesus is the only one who can X out your fear and your anger and your guilt. When you look at that, you say, Jesus is the only one that can do it. You gotta know this. The world can't get this. You gotta understand this. The world doesn't understand peace or no peace because Jesus is peace. And without Jesus, you can't understand peace. So we who are believers, though we struggle with it at times, peace is available to us as believers. It comes through Christ. He's the author of peace. And the only way that you, listen to this, no counselor can X out your peace. No pastor can X out your peace. No self-help book can do it. No 1-800 number can do it. No six-figure salary. No raising perfect kids. No straight A's. Only Jesus the Christ can eliminate our peace. Superpower, super supernatural power of God. That's what will do it. He can X out the deeper issues that are keeping peace from our lives. That's what it means in verse 7 where he says that I would experience God's peace which is more wonderful than the human mind can understand. That's it. Romans chapter 5 says, therefore since we've been made right in God's sight by faith we have peace with God because why? Of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done. Well, what has Jesus Christ, our Lord, done for us? I'm a visual guy tonight. He died on the cross for us. And not only did he die on the cross, when he died on the cross, you know what he did? He nailed our fear on the cross. Our fear was nailed on the cross. Our anger was nailed to the cross. Do you understand this? Our sickness was nailed to the cross. And when Jesus went into the grave and he rose from the grave, guess what he didn't take with him? He didn't take our sickness, our anger, our fear, and all those other things. They stayed dead and buried in the ground. And if we want to keep resurrecting him, he'll let us do it. But Jesus said, you don't have to do that. I've got that for you. Man, your fear, your anger, all of these different things that eliminate and just drive into our craziness in our chaos. Jesus says, I've already taken care of those things. Just look to me. What does it mean? You want peace? There's where it's at. You got to get back to the cross because that's where our peace lies. 
And Jesus, take it from us. Jesus, I'm going to spend my time focusing on you, what you've done and what you have made available to me. I'm not going to believe the world's lie any longer. I'm going to admit that I can't do it on my own. I'm going, to, I'm going to acknowledge that you're the only one that can bring me peace. And then I'm going to ask you to give it to me. And then I'm going to accept your gift. And I'm going to move forward and see you do what no man can do in my life. Let me close with this one statement. Here's how I summarize everything. Let me just give the sermon in a sentence. And some of you say, why didn't you do that at the very beginning? I got it. Here it is. You and I have a choice. We can keep playing games and avoid peace. Or we can pursue God's fix and exchange our restlessness, the fear, the anger, and the guilt for his rest. And then those that are around us are going to see something different. Those around us are going to see something that they need as now we shine peace into a dark and a crazy world. Oh, yeah. Why don't you stand to your feet as we close out tonight? Let me tell you, sometimes I'm up here taking a shower. Don't let your mind go there, okay? Spiritual shower, okay? Spiritual shower. And some of the water just splashes off on everybody else because this is something I need. I need it so much. We all need it, don't we? We live in a crazy, wild world. And it's so easy to let us, for us, to push peace and all of those fruit of the spirit in our life inside and just be sucked into the world's stuff when Jesus said I, I came that you that you would just be in the world but not of the world I created you to be not of the world but in the world I, you are from a different world you're from my kingdom and my kingdom only knows peace and joy and love and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. I don't want to, I don't have to worry anymore if I look to the cross and say, Jesus, take it away. I'm going to focus on the peace that you have for my life. Things are going to be different. Father, thank you for this time. Lord, I just ask in this moment that you would speak to each of our lives. Don't let us take this lightly. But before we leave this place, Lord, let us deal with this in our life. Maybe you're here. Keep your heads bowed. Maybe you're here in this room. You say, Brad, I need peace. (laughs) I'm in turmoil half the time, and I I love God, but I just need his peace today. I need it. I don't need to explain it any further. Lift your hand right now if that's you. All over this room, I'm going to pray for you. Oh, man, there's so many hands. Here's what I want you to do. We're going to finish this way. Uh, uh, before you come down, there's some of you in this room that you don't have peace because you've never accepted Jesus. You've never accepted his sacrifice on the cross that gives you peace. You live in a world of craziness and there's no way to get out of it. The only way you can get out of it is by turning your life over to Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. And you say, Brad, I need that tonight. If that's you and and you say, I just need peace, I'm just going to open the altar. We're going to pray down here at the end. I'm going to pray for you and we're going to leave. So open up the stanchions. If you say, Brad, pray for me. I want peace in my life. This is ministered to me tonight. Let's pray that we can have peace and we can have this breakthrough and that God will do something special. And break this turmoil, break these issues, break these things that are going on. Come on down to the front as we pray. Okay, we're going to give you a minute. Thank you, guys. Just come on out. Thank you. Praise God. Praise God. Those of you that feel, man, I'm I'm an arm's length from God. I'm not experiencing the best in life because I need, I need Jesus. I want you to come as well. Some of us are playing games with these things in our lives, these fruit and the things that God has for us. And God's saying, tonight I want to break all of that. Thank God. I want you just to stretch your hands out. If you're in your seats, there's still room. Keep on coming. People are still coming. I want you to stretch out your hands because we're going to pray for these. And many of you in your seats right now, God has something special for you. He's got something special for us. He wants us to live the high life that he created for us. He doesn't want us to break all of that up. He doesn't want us to play games with it. He wants us to trust him and enjoy all the good things that he has. And he's got that for us tonight. So, Father... In the name of Jesus, right now, I pray for each person that's come forward. And those that are in our seats as well. And say, man, I I deal with this every day. I live in a world of noise. I live in a world of craziness. 
And my life just seems so many times like it's out of control. I pray, God, in this moment that your peace and your strength and your control will come in the life. It's not, not our control, God. You take control in our lives. Bring the peace where there's turmoil, God. Bring the peace where there's, where there's no understanding. Bring the peace where we have questions. God, bring the peace into our lives where we have fear, where we have anxiety. God, bring the peace into our lives. And for those that have come, I pray, Lord, that you would just whisper peace into their lives, that you would breathe upon us. And as we leave this place, Lord, that we will be taking those steps towards seeing you come and change us from the inside out. We don't want to be the same. God, we look to the cross because that's where our answers are. For those of you that need Jesus tonight, you need peace in your heart. You need peace. You've never experienced the Prince of Peace, Jesus. Why don't you just pray this prayer? We're all going to pray it together. Let's pray it together. Just say, dear God, God, I need you now now. to come into my life, to to forgive me of my sin, to take away my guilt, to take away my shame. I want to serve you, Jesus. I want to follow you, Jesus. Forgive me of my sins as I follow you every day. Thank you for your peace that passes all comprehension. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we put our hands together and thank God for what he's done tonight? Are you glad you came to church tonight? House of prayer. Thank you all. I'm so proud of every one of you. And listen, make sure you're here this Sunday. We're starting this brand new, I mean, it's the biggest thing we've done all year. You've got to be here, okay? A a revolutionary church. This is going to be a life-changing event for these next several weeks. So plan on showing up, okay? Thank you guys for being here tonight. Go in the peace of God that passes all understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you all. You're dismissed.